All right, we can go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Emily Ramirez. I'm a fourth year uh, pediatric neurology resident, member of the Grand Rounds Planning Committee. Um, if you have any questions for our speaker this morning, please place them in the chat and I'll do a Q&A for us at the end. This morning, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Steven Stephenson. Dr. Stephenson is a board certified neurologist and former active duty Navy officer who is recognized as a national leader in health innovation. He earned his MD at University of Oklahoma College of Medicine in Oklahoma City. He then went on to complete neurology residency at National Capital Consortium at the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, and Walter Reed Army Hospital in Washington, DC. He's heavily involved in clinical education and neurology for Dell Med, and is currently appointed Associate Professor of Medical Education, Population Health, and Neurology. He serves as Chief of Innovation of the National Military Health System from 2014 to 2016, and he's current executive director of the Defense and Veteran Health Collaborative for UT Health. Dr. Stephenson has also been a lifelong advocate for the arts and humanities, focusing on the importance of medical humanities to clinical practice. He currently practices neurology both inpatient at Del Seton and outpatient in the Comprehensive Memory Center at Mulva Clinic for the Neurosciences. Today, we will hear from Dr. Stephenson on his talk entitled, To See a World in a Brain of Man, a Narrative History. Thank you, Dr. Stephenson. Thank you, Emily. So um, I have decided for today to tackle a pretty large and um, somewhat controversial topic um, about cerebral dominance and lateralization in the cerebral hemispheres. And I hope to do it through the lens of the humanities. And, um, really channeling, hopefully, some uh, people that I look up to and admire. And I have a lot to get through, so I'm going to go ahead and, and jump right in here, hopefully. I have no financial conflicts of interest. Um, however, I am certainly heavily influenced by Ghost of the Humanities, um, which I think you guys will appreciate during the course of this talk. Um, I, uh, if we're with any luck, we'll get through about three poems uh, during the course of this talk. Um, I'm also guided by the works of uh, someone named Ian McGilchrist, and many, many others. Uh, I have been invested in this topic uh, pretty um, heavily ever since agreeing to do this, uh, this Grand Rounds and reading, um, uh, gosh, countless sort of original articles on some of the talk and early history of our understanding of lateral, lateralization in the brain. But, um, you know, one of the things that really started this uh, was uh, a conversation I had with my piano teacher. Some of you know I, I take piano lessons, I'm a novice beginner, but, um, and uh, was having this conversation about the brain and music, um, which I hope to do as a completely separate uh, Grand Rounds talk at some point. Um, and he mentioned, hey, have you heard of this uh, book? You know, it's called The Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist, and I had never heard of it. Um, and picked it up, and he and I started uh, reading it. Um, he finished way earlier than I did, um, but uh, began sort of a conversation about the overlap of uh, the neurosciences and the history of uh, the Western world, which is the subtitle of this book. The Master and His Emissary is a, a reference to a Nietzsche, a story by Nietzsche talking about a mass, uh, this um, ruler in a, in a foreign land who um, was bringing peace and prosperity to his um, country. And as the country began to grow, however, he was unable to um, manage the affairs at a local level um, because it was of the growth and, and prosperity of the kingdom. And so he nominated an emissary um, to cover the day-to-day -day activities, allowing him sort of a wider perspective on the happenings of the kingdom. And um, what happened is the emissary ultimately um, uh, thought that he was better than the master and, and tried to subvert the master and, and resulting in the fall of the, of the kingdom as, as the story goes. And so that's the reference in the title. And then the subtitle is The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. And I think what really appealed to me about the book and why I became so just enthralled by it, uh, it's a very large book. About a third of the book actually is um, dedicated to just endnotes and footnotes and references. Um, but the reason I became so, I think, attached to it was it really did a nice job of combining for me the two things that I, I love the most, and, and that's the brain and neuroanatomy in particular, um, and the humanities and, and the history of the, of the humanities. Um, and so I hope to sort of do that justice here today. I'll be channeling him and others quite a bit in the talk. So the, the title of my talk, um, To See a World in a Brain of Man as a play on words to a William Blake poem, 
called Augury's of Innocence, and I'm just going to read it real quick. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. A robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. A dove house filled with doves and pigeons shudders hell through all its regions. A dog starved at his master's gate predicts the ruin of the state. A horse misused upon the road calls to heaven for human blood. Each outcry of the hunted hare, a fiber from the brain does tear. Um, I like this poem. It's one of his more famous um, poems. Many, many of you have probably heard it, um, but uh, we're going to be talking about hopefully uh, not making this hour an eternity for you, but uh, it's got a lot to get through in the next hour. So, um, you know, the topic is, is controversial, I think, because of just how popularized the idea of left brain, right brain has become. I remember even in um, middle school being taught about uh, how to draw on the right side of your brain and these concept of um, this division of the two hemispheres where, you know, the left brain is more about um, artistic expression and the left brain is more about math and order and linearity. Um, and you see these sort of posters and diagrams and t-shirts all over. This is sort of a blown up one here. I am the left brain. I am a scientist, a mathematician, etc. And the right brain, I am the right brain. I am creativity, a free spirit. And it seems to sort of pit the two against each other in a way that makes them exclusive of each other, um, in a way that makes them seem that they have complete dominance over a particular um, so something that the brain does. And that's just not true. The, both hemispheres um, perceive the world um, in very different ways. It's not what they do that's different, it's how they do it that's different. So mathematics, for example, is very well represented in the same areas in an analogous way to how music is represented in the right hemisphere and appreciation for music and mathematics. And what um, the, the master and his emissary sort of talks about is this idea that our perception of the world starts with a right brain perception of, of the gestalt of everything that is available to us in our environment in a very open way. And then when it needs and requires our focused attention, the left hemisphere seems to predominate. Um, and ultimately whatever is learned from that focused attention gets sent back to the right hemisphere in a way for integration into the perception of the world to a new perception of the world. And it's this back and right balance between the two hemispheres um, that, uh, that is, is really talked about um, the most in, in the book. And it's not this division necessarily between one and the other. Although, as we'll see, one, one way or one way of perceiving the world or one perspective of the world can predominate and has its consequences. So talking about um, a little bit more about hemispheric asymmetry, you know, as, a, as the lead for gross anatomy and the neuroanatomy course, um, this is a brain from one of our um, uh, donors that we had. And you can see the anterior posterior orientation here on left and right. And I think we should just start with the question of why is the brain divided? Why do we have two hemispheres? Um, it's connected by this area called the corpus callosum in the middle there, which we'll get to, but, but why do we have two hemispheres? Why do we need two hemispheres? Why, do we, why isn't it a single organ um, instead of uh, two completely separate uh, hemispheres? And they are different. <laughs> in fact, you can see in this image here, the left posterior region tends to be a little bit larger, whereas the right um, anterior region tends to be a little bit larger, which we'll get to as well. So asymmetry is something that is, um, uh, the, the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna be driving home the point that yes, indeed, the brain is asymmetric. It is not equal on both sides there. And that, that asymmetry is what's going to lead to the difference in perspective and a different way of dealing with the world, um, even though they're, they're dealing with the world, uh, the same world. Um, this is a quote by Louis Pasteur I like, life as manifested to us is a function of the asymmetry of the universe. I can imagine that all living species are primordially in their structure, in their external forms, functions of cosmic asymmetry. And, you know, this kind of pitting against one against the other, this um, yin and yang, this sort of black and white sort of view of, of how things play or balance against each other is something that has been recognized by philosophers, you know, forever since the dawn of humanity. <clears throat> So we're going to start with two cases. Um, these are, are real cases I had. I changed some of the details uh, just to, for um, health, protected health information. But um, the first case is a 60-year-old woman who came in with uh, adenocarcinoma that was metastatic to the right hemisphere. Um, this was her brain MRI. This is an image of her brain MRI. And you can see, just to orient those who may not be familiar with looking at um, 
At brain MRIs, this is at what we call an axial cut, looking at the brain through this direction. So the right and left are actually switched and flipped just to make things extra complicated. And we have the anterior, posterior, the back, the head, the person laying on their back. And so the right posterior region of the brain, that's the area called the parietal lobe, has this dark circular area. This is a metastatic or spread of the lung cancer to the area of the right posterior parietal lobe. And then this white area that you see is some of the swelling and edema um, from, from that particular tumor. She came in, actually, she was completely oriented. She, was, she knew her name, place, exactly where she was in the hospital. Um, she uh, seemed pretty ambivalent about any of her um, difficulties or deficits that she was having. Um, she really didn't seem to care or even notice that she had any, any deficits, even when pointing them out. Um, <clears throat> she uh, uh, was, didn't have a lot of weakness. She, on exam, I can remember, she seemed to have intact visual fields. But whenever we ask her to draw a clock, we ask her to draw a big circle and then put the numbers of the clock, just like an old wall clock, this is what she drew. Um, so many of you recognize this as a hemispatial neglect um, with all of the numbers lining up on that right side. In fact, her son would tell us that when eating her dinner, she would only eat everything on the right side of her plate and would completely ignore everything on the left side of her plate to the point that he had to turn the plate around in order for her to finish eating uh, the food on her plate. Um, hemispatial neglect is one of the peculiar things that, that we get to see in neurology. Um, it, it doesn't seem to make sense. Patients don't have any um, loss of vision. They don't have any loss of visual field. Typically, they can see things on the left side of space. It's just that that side of space does not exist for them. Um, things on that side of space do not exist for them. Um, one of the classic ways we teach it is, is in the, in the uh, patient inpatient uh, exam bed. We line people up around the outer perimeter of the bed, and I'll be standing on the patient's left side and say, I want you to point and count to everybody that's in the room, and they'll start on their right side and go all the way to the foot of the bed and stop. Even though I'm standing on their left side, they won't point to me or, or finish the circle um, around the bed towards me. Um, that side of the world just doesn't exist. In fact, it's, it can be so extreme that they'll deny the existence of their contralateral limb, their left hand. When shown to them, well, whose hand is this? They'll say, I don't know, that's the person in the next bed. That's not my hand. Um, and so it's a really hard thing for us to wrap our heads around um, because it's so foreign to our way of understanding the world. And the reason it's foreign is because we have an intact right parietal lobe. But when that area is damaged, your perspective of the world fundamentally changes. What's interesting about it is it's not just what, what you experience in the world, but what you imagine in the world. And there was a classic study, a, a historical case in the late 1970s, looking at the Cathedral Square in Milan. There was an 80-year-old woman. She had a stroke. Her initials were IG, I'm um, 86, she, um, and had a hemispatial neglect. But she had lived in Milan her entire life. She had worked uh, in this area of the cathedral. And so she was very well familiar with all of the buildings and structures uh, in, on Cathedral Square. And so the researchers said, I want you to imagine that you're standing facing the cathedral. And I want you to, can you picture that in your head? And she said, yes, I can see it very clearly. I've been there you know, hundreds of times. And they said, okay, I want you to describe all of the buildings that you see in your mind. Now, again, she's not physically there. There was no pictures, there was no maps. The researchers did create a map, however, of um, all of the buildings in the area and said, okay, so you're standing facing the cathedral IG and we want you to name all of the buildings that you see. And she proceeded to name um, the buildings on her right side um, that were she was imagining. And they said, okay, now we want you to change your perspective. We want you to walk forward and we want you to stand on the steps of the cathedral facing the opposite direction. And now I want you to name every single building that's in Cathedral Square. And she didn't name the buildings that she had just named. Instead, she proceeded to name all of the buildings now on her opposite side, on her right side again, but from a different perspective. And so this idea of hemispatial neglect actually is not just something that um, is, is our physical presence within the world, but it's also our imagined space. We, we have a complete neglect for that side of, of our reality, and that's due to the right hemisphere um, being uh, injured. I'm going to talk about another case, um, a 60 year old woman I took care of who had an uh, anaplastic oligodendroglioma. Um, many of the residents also took care of this patient um, and may remember her. Um, she had, it was involving her left frontal lobe. Um, and we saw her after resection. She came in because she was having seizures. She had been on seizure medicines and actually had been pretty stable at home. The, the family noted that you know, she'd had this uh, tumor for a long time. She had had it resected and she was about 60% her baseline. She could um, communicate very minimally. She really couldn't get a lot of words out. 
Um, and on our exam, when we first saw her, she could uh, say only a few um, stuttering words. She could name the badge, a watch. She could name things um, when asked about them. And she could repeat. She could repeat fairly well if we gave her a phrase to repeat. But there was no spontaneous fluent speech. She was, she was non-fluent in her speech. Nothing was just spontaneously coming out of her until I asked her to sing. So the way I typically do it on the, in the exam room is to clap a rhythm out and say like, jingle bells, jingle bells, and have the patient continue singing. And she was able to do that with Frosty the Snowman, with jingle bells, um, and continued uh, um, her singing. And, and, but yet she couldn't really um, create any spontaneous speech. This was her uh, MRI, again, right and left sort of orientation there. And in that left frontal region, you can see where she had had most of her left frontal lobe um, resected. Um, this actually uh, involved a larger portion of the frontal lobe that I'm showing you here. Um, and when we talk about problems of language, which she was having, she was not able to get her words out. She seemed to understand and comprehend. She could follow command. She could follow two of a three-step command um, quite well, actually, in, in the beginning of her hospital course. Um, we start to, to, we label these aphasias or difficulties with language. And, and many of the residents and faculty on, have tried to memorize these, some version of this aphasia chart here before, which doesn't include reading and writing, which we would also include, but is a good way to sort of figure out what kind of aphasia or language problem does the person have? Are they fluent? Can they comprehend? Are they able to repeat? And by following this sort of tree, you can get down to the type of aphasia that they have, and there are variations of this and, and, um, and so forth. But where did all this come from and why is all of this important? I wanted to highlight these two cases because in the first case, we have a right side hemispheric lesion. And in the second case, we have a left side hemispheric lesion and they present with very different presentations. Um, and so, so this idea that the brain, um, that lesions in the brain can present with specific clinical presentations was something that, that neurologists had noticed um, you know, for over a century and really got its start in the heyday around language, around this concept of language in the, in the 1860s. There was a guy named um, uh, Gustav Dax and his, and his father actually, who in the early 1860s, even in the late 1850s, had started to put together a series of cases where they noticed that people who had left side frontal lesions would present with this kind of broken disfluent speech. But the person that's often credited is Broca, we call it a Broca's aphasia, Pierre Paul Broca in 1861, um, started with two cases. Um, Tonton was the nickname for this particular patient um, who came in. He had had seizures most of his life, had been disfluent, could only get the words Tonton out whenever he would speak, but yet could comprehend quite well. Um, he came in, unfortunately, with, he was hemiparetic. He had a weakness on, on his uh, right side. Um, and uh, ended up developing gangrene and died, and, and Broca was able to um, look at his brain and found this lesion in the left anterior frontal regions, very similar to the patient that I talked about. Soon after that, uh, another patient came in, was only able to get a few words out, including his nickname Lalo, I think it was, um, and, and a few numbers, if I recall, um, and uh, he also succumbed, and, and his brain also showed a very similar lesion in the anterior left frontal lobe. And Broca started to catalog in a very methodical way to his credit, um, a series of cases that in, the, in around 1865 he published, um, and thus uh, this particular lesion that produces this type of this uh, disfluent aphasia um, um, bears his name. And this is really the dawn of sort of this idea of lateralization. Many more studies around language in particular followed. Um, we have Wernicke's aphasia, other sort of named uh, aphasias um, that affect more comprehension and so forth. Um, and this is where we started to, to tr appreciate that there seems to be a difference when you affect the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere in particular seems to be quote unquote dominant and the right hemisphere tends to be fairly silent with lesions. In fact, it was considered the lesser hemisphere for over a century because of, an, of a, a failure to really recognize some of the deficits that, that can be created with right hemispheric lesions, which I'm hoping to dispel for you today. Um, so um, what was going on in this uh, left anterior frontal lobe? There definitely is hemispheric asymmetry. When actually look at the um, brain and, and axial cross section, you can see the, this area called the planum temporal was noticed to be much larger on the left side, involved in language and language comprehension, whereas Heschel's gyrus involved in um, the appreciation of differences in, in hearing was more um, was larger on the right side and tend to have sort of this um, two lo lo lobes or lobules. 
Um, and also the, the angle or pitch of this uh, crease, this sylvian fissure that we see here, tends to be a little bit more acute on the left side than on the right side. Um, and we see this sort of growth of tissue in the um, left frontal region. Um, that was attributed. Some, some recent studies, actually, some meta-analysis have started to question this a little bit. I don't have time to go into all of that, but um, some of you may be familiar with the Enigma study that is looking at, you know, tens of thousands of different MRI scans and trying to quantify them across age and, and gender and so forth. And they're starting to dispute some of the specificity of this or sensitivity of this. But, um, but for the most part, there's definitely asymmetry between the left and right side. And this was first appreciated really in the 1860s in terms of its effect on language. The other thing um, that we see in terms of asymmetry is that the brain seems to be sort of torqued or seems to have this torque effect to it. And there's something called patalia or patalia, um, which originally was a word used to describe the indentation on the inside of the surface of the skull as the brain develops over a person's life. And what was noticed is that the right anterior portion, sort of alluded to earlier on the gross anatomy picture, tends to protrude anteriorly, whereas the left posterior portion of the brain tends to protrude posteriorly. It's almost as if somebody took a hold of the brain and torqued it, and this is something called Yakovlevian torque. Um, Yakovlev uh, was a Russian neuroscientist who fled Russia in 1919 and is, is pretty famous for his series of whole brain uh, microtome sections of the brain of different pathologies. Um, I had the good fortune of um, rotating in the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology at Washington, D.C., where, where this collection is actually housed. And if we have time, I can show anyone interested some pictures at the end. But um, from that, but Yakovlev was one of the first people to sort of notice this, this, this torque or this uh, apparent rotational aspect of um, the frontal lobe anteriorly in the front uh, on the right side and posteriorly on the left uh, in the occipital lobe. And so why might that be? Well, um, it turns out that there is a little bit more white matter tissue in the right uh, uh, hemisphere. Um, and that and tends to get a lot more interconnectivity within the hemispheres. In fact, both hemispheres have a little bit more connectivity um, interhemispheric than between hemispheres. This has been subsequently shown in, in some of the Enigma studies that I was talking about earlier, where they've been doing these serial scans showing that these differences do actually exist between uh, the right and left side and actually been able to quantify it and, and uh, 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 prove that it exists across different um, generations and, and gender um, uh, breakdown. So what about the corpus callosum? I alluded to the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is the structure that sits right between the two hemispheres. So in this beautiful etching uh, from Andreas Vesalius' uh, anatomy textbook from 1543 um, shows this quite nicely. We have the two hemispheres um, on both sides and right down the middle is this white matter structure um, that was originally thought to bridge the two hemispheres, to connect the two hemispheres uh, in, in mammals. Um, between, between them is a way of um, communicating information from one hemisphere to the other. And there are a series of lesions where when this gets disrupted, it presents with specific um, characteristic findings. This picture, by the way, is um, a picture I took, um, shaky hand and an iPhone over an actual copy of a first edition uh, 1543 uh, Vesalius anatomy textbook. Um, and, and it was at the Harry Ransom Center. For those who have not been to the UT Harry Ransom Center, it is an international treasure. They have two first edition copies of this alias's anatomy textbook uh, and one second edition copy from 1555, actually. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so these are the, uh, this corpus callosum has been well documented and well known, but wasn't really clear in exactly what it, did, what it did. And in the 1860s, this guy, William Henry Flower, I'm working on some previous work by a guy named Owens and referencing Owens. Um, noted that the corpus callosum was so specific to um, placental mammals that it was as diagnostic as having a placenta to be a placental mammal. So it's something that is highly unique to placental mammals and this connection between the two. What's interesting is that while most of the connections, uh, and there's only about 2% of all of the nerves, about 300 to 500 million um, connections between the two hemispheres connect uh, across the corpus callosum, while most of those are excitatory, leveraging glutamate, um, a not insignificant portion of those are inhibitory using GABA. Um, even the excitatory um, neurons that cross the corpus callosum tend to interface on inner neurons that are inhibitory. And so there seems to be, there is a big debate right now and where they're still trying to settle some of this, where it still seems to be in favor of an excitatory function and has a, a variability anterior to posterior in different regions of the brain on the effect it has. 
Um, but there's some speculation that actually one of the purposes of the corpus callosum is actually to quiet down or inhibit um, the contralateral hemisphere, which has implications for what I'll talk about later. The other observation is that as the brain grows in size across evolutionary time, the corpus callosum has actually not kept up, has actually gotten smaller. I mean, so if we look at the um, mid-sagittal corpus callosal area related to brain volume, we actually see that in humans, it's fairly quite small, that the corpus callosum actually shrinks over evolutionary time as opposed to um, getting larger as the brain gets larger. And so this need to connect the two hemispheres and to communicate between the two hemispheres has actually shrunk um, over time. So there's long been a recognition that language seems to be uh, affiliated with um, hand postures and gesticulation. In fact, I can't help myself in moving my own hands around, as you guys have probably noticed, but and most of us have witnessed this and others, is that communication and handedness or dominance and, and, and communication through gestures has been something that has been um, well documented. In the 1970s, they actually did a series using a video um, to catalog and, and, and look at how often a person who is left brain dominant for language, for example, um, would gesticulate with their right arm and showed a high correlation between the two. And right handedness is something that about 90%, upwards of 96%, of um, people across all cultures seem to be right-handed, and there's a high correlation with language and language dominance, and so why might that be the case? Um, this has gone back for um, over 50 centuries. In fact, Corin and Porak um, analyzed close to 1,200 drawings, paintings, and sculptures over 50 centuries on multiple um, different uh, um, uh, uh, environments to look for the, uh, a clear hand dominance or hand preference and found about a 92% um, using their right hand in, in different pictures. So this is something that is highly preserved across cultures, across time, um, and seems to be associated with language too. Why might that be? Why is it that the things that we reach out to to grasp um, are so affiliated with our, our left hemisphere? We'll get to that. So the evolution of hand dominance, we can look at even cave paintings, we can look at tools that were made um, by early prehistoric man, and we see that um, cave paintings are mostly the left hand, and that's thought to be because the right hand would actually serve as the tool to um, uh, uh, paint on the cave walls. Um, and so you had to hold the tool with the paint uh, to be able to um, apply the paint while your left hand was against the wall. And they've also looked at different tools from prehistoric times and, and even, uh, even more modern times in certain tribes to see that they would rotate it with their left hand while striking it with their dominant right hand. And so this right hand uh, dominance has been present for as long as human existence. Um, and it used to be thought that, that humans, because of the correlation between language dominance and, um, uh, and hand gestures, that humans were the only ones that had a preference uh, in their hand. I mean, it wasn't until really the last century or so that we started to see, actually, no, almost all animals, almost all species have some handedness, have some dominance of their hand. And in fact, in Kansas, they started discovering these trilobites that seem to have these right-sided uh, bite marks in them. And one of the predators at the time had these two arm-like uh, protrusions. Um, and it was uh, postulated, this was over 500 million years ago at the dawn of sort of time, um, that there was handedness as far as 500 million years ago. And in fact, lateralization of nervous system structures dates back even farther to that, to some of the most primitive life forms show a lateralization of, of uh, dominance in um, neural networks and, and neural organization dating back 700 million years. So what about facial asymmetry and reflection of the brain? The Venus de Milo is a famous statue um, discovered in 1820 in a farm by a farmer and ultimately given to the Louvre um, through Henry XVIII. And um, when it was first uh, displayed, uh, they said, you know, you really should look at it from the right side to appreciate all of its uh, splendor. It was noticed that, you know what, it's actually not very symmetric. We sort of, uh, at the time, were sort of championing and cherishing um, symmetry in, in art and statues and the human face and human form being close to godliness. But it turns out that the statue is not that, despite its draw to us, is not uh, symmetric. And and when and, and it was actually heavily criticized at the time. Um, in fact, saying, "Oh, maybe she had a limp." Even look at the way she's standing. Um, and so, uh, but it was uh, soon, of course, realized that actually all faces are asymmetric. Um, and studies in the 1930s actually tried to illustrate this point a little bit by taking a photo, splitting it down the middle and creating composites of a right right composite and a left left composite and then asking the people who they took the photo which one do you think looks more like you. 
and asking strangers who don't know the person, which one looks more like the original. And what's interesting is that strangers see the right, right pictures as more similar to the whole face as you probably do or, or might. Whereas the person who's photographed actually identify themselves more with the left, left composite. Um, for anyone who's a social media fan using TikTok, this is like all the rage right now, these left, left and right, right composites. Um, many of you have seen these, but uh, really got its start in, in the 1930s with some of the work done here. And so that sort of brings up a whole question of like, well, if the right hemisphere seems to elevate the um, left side of the mouth um, first, whenever we smile or whenever we talk, there seems to be this laterality of emotion and, and emotional expressivity. Um, and so, for example, when we look at these faces, you can instantly and in, in across cultures identify the emotional expression um, being expressed here across these six different types. Um, and that is a function of the right hemisphere when they've actually done studies to say, what is it that is perceiving these emotional states? When we do composites though, it's what's interesting and what stands out is it's always the left left composite that looks more emotionally expressive. And that's controlled again by the right hemisphere. And so if you look at the right right versus the left left, the left left looks a little bit more. And if you were to superimpose and do this on your own head, looking at some of the other faces there, you can probably see how a left left uh, composite would, would show more emotion even across the other examples given. I like this next study because they were looking, they were trying to be, they were interested in, well, how are emotion, are emotions lateralized to the brain? Are the expressivity of emotions and our outward sort of expression of emotions, not just from a facial feature perspective, but from an intention perspective, are they somehow lateralized in the brain? And using transcranial direct stimulation, where they actually apply electrical stimulation to activate one hemisphere over another, um, they created a scenario where they had the participants write a controversial paper on a topic, a controversial uh, paragraph, uh, you know, on a, on a controversial topic. Um, and then they would give that uh, writing sample to another participant to review and then show the feedback from that other participant to the original participant. Um, and then they would involve the two participants in a game. They would set them down in a computer and they would say, okay, every time you see a green X appear on the screen, you hit the shift bar or space bar. And if you do that before your opponent, then you get to punish the opponent or you get to inflict uh, a loud noise on the opponent. And you get to decide, by the way, how loud and how long that uh, noise is as a sign of like, okay, how, how aggressive do you wanna be? So what was happening is that they their the obvious thing is there was no other opponent. It was just the single participant. The participant would write a paper or an essay on a controversial topic, and they would heavily critique it, being very insulting and degrading in their responses. And the idea being to invoke anger and invoke sort of resentment in, in the participants. And then they would play the participant against a fake participant, where the odds of hitting the shift bar were actually guided by, um, not by chance, but split down the middle 50-50. And what they found is that when patients were stimulated in their left frontal region, they tended to have more of an anger or aggressive response um, to, to their anger. So they would play the sounds longer or louder, whereas if they were stimulated on the right side, it had no effect on how long they would stimulate the, the anger response. Um, and they also did a sham portion of this where they just stimulated for 30 seconds and which doesn't, isn't long enough to activate and there was no effect on, on that. And so what this seemed to suggest is that um, the left frontal lobe actually is more responsive and, and uh, responsible for um, anger. And this has been tested in lots of different ways and is actually one of the emotions that more heavily lateralizes as anger seems to be to the left hemisphere. So what about hearing? So is there a lateralization of hearing? So some early studies in the 1970s looked at this dichotic listening task where they would put headphones on a patient and play two different sounds in either ear. Um, and say, I'm hearing somebody else's speaker here. Morning. Oh, that's Ethan. <laughs> um, so what would happen is uh, they would play two different sounds, like two different consonant vowel sounds, like ka, ba, um, and see which one did the participant hear. Now, hearing is, is unique in the ear in that it's doubly represented in both hemispheres. Um, it's very hard to go deaf, completely deaf from a single lesion in the brain. So sound coming into the left ear with this orange line here does go to both hemispheres, both the right and the left hemisphere. But there is a preferential exposure of the contralateral hemisphere to whatever the left ear hears. In this case, the right ear will hear preferentially. And what they found is that for normal language, for consonant vowel sounds, um, when it was different sounds were played in either ear, the left hemisphere tended to dominate and actually suppress what the right ear was hearing. And so so they would say only what 
um, in this case, the right ear was hearing that the left hemisphere was processing. However, when they change the sound to be more of an emotional sound like crying, laughter, um, and playing two different kinds of emotional sounds or different languages even or nonsensical sounds in either ear, it switched and the left ear became more dominant to recognize more emotional sounds, emotionally charged sounds, different languages, nonsensical sounds tend to localize to, to the right hemisphere. Again, sort of putting forward this idea that novelty or new sounds that were a little harder to understand tended to, to localize to, to one side or the other. I know this is a controversial topic. I see Dr. Henry coming off of mute even, and that we'll talk a little bit more about what this will mean in, in the last uh, portion of this. Some of this has been contested um, and we'll get into some of what the generalizations can mean about this uh, later. So what causes the right versus uh, left lateralization? Um, you know, the hunt for a particular gene, looking for one gene that causes this lateralization of the brain has been elusive. In fact, there are many, many genes that have been identified, but there is a nature component to this, a genetic component to this. There's a structure called the node in the developing um, embryo that has the cilia that beats in a particular direction, aligning genetic information on one side, um, on the left side in particular, creating a left-right symmetry within the organism. And this does have an impact on handedness, but it's not the whole story of handedness. So recent estimates count the number of genetic loci involved in handedness to be at least 30 to 40 different loci. There's also a nurture component or um, the exposure to the environment component. And this picture shows a chick inside an egg and it's not by accident that the, the chick's right eye is facing up, it's left eye is protected. Um, what they found is that exposure to ambient light in the course of um, uh, incubation um, actually produces a lateralization of vision in, in chicks. Um, and so that if you incubate them in with no light, you actually get a 50-50 split across the lateralization of vision. But if you incubate them under normal conditions, um, you get a high degree of lateralization of vision. And so there seems to be these environmental cues as well. And a recent large scale twin study that was reported that um, genetic effects only account for about 23% of variance in handedness while the remaining 70% uh, seem to be accounted by environmental influence. So there is a strong environmental influence that's driving some of this as well. So what about perception of the environment? Um, I really like this study done in pigeons um, and looking at uh, how smart pigeons are, that they don't just have a bird brain. What they did with these pigeons is that they trained them to recognize human faces. Um, over non-human faces. And the way that they would do that is they would get a reward every time a, a human face was projected and, and, uh, and every time that they didn't respond, they would get some sort of small uh, penalty. I think it was even like, a, I don't know if it was a shock or not, I can't remember, but they would get some sort of penalty and they would be able to train them to appropriately and accurately um, uh, pick out the human faces in a photo that they saw. Now, what's unique about birds and how their visual systems work, which is different than humans, is that the right eye, um, information coming in from the, into the bird's right eye, is, it goes to the left hemisphere. Um, almost all of that crosses contralaterally to the contralateral hemisphere versus information in the left eye goes to the right hemisphere. In humans, um, we get a bilateral representation in our hemispheres of our entire visual field, but in birds, it's one eye perceives, um, one, uh, one hemisphere perceives what the one eye sees, and it's the opposite for the other one. So you can actually cover one eye and create a scenario where you can tell what is it that one hemisphere is seeing and how does it perceive the environment. And so what they did is they trained these um, uh, birds to actually identify humans in pictures. And so here we have left hemisphere, right eye. Is there a human in this picture? Yes right hemisphere, left eye is there, yes. And so they were able to appropriately train them, but then they would take these images and scramble the image um, and break it up into smaller and smaller chunks. And what they found is that the left hemisphere using the right eye was still able to pick out individual pieces of a human, which it categorized as a human. Whereas the right hemisphere using the left eye started to break down once it started to get um, outside the realm of of being able to pick out an individual eyeball, for example, or a nose or whatever it was using to try to identify what made it a human, um, it, it uh, responded with this sort of no response. And then what they did is they, they took this a similar image and instead of chopping it up into little bits, um, they makes it look like a massacre scene. They took an image of a human, um, they broke it up into the different limbs and then did the same sort of scenario and said the left hemisphere continued to see the evidence of a human even when the human was broken up into multiple different bits like this 
But the right hemisphere seemed to perceive very quickly that this was no longer represented a human. They tend to be perceiving and, and sort of uh, suggested at least that the two hemispheres are using different strategies to perceive the world. So this has been subsequently followed up by a number of studies looking at um, a very fundamental question that I think gets to the heart of why we have two cerebral hemispheres and, and was at the heart of, of most of the reading that I was doing on this topic was that um, an animal has to, has to understand, all, all creatures have to find a way to eat and not be eaten. And it seems that in order to do that, we need to have two representations of the world, two different ways of perceiving the world. We need to be able to perceive the world in a very focused way so that we can, in this case, look for the difference between a seed and a grain of sand. But we also need the ability to perceive environmental threats, looking at the entire hemisphere, not being able to necessarily discern what might be a threat, but, but thinking about the entire environment at once and then being able to investigate um, the potential for threat. And, and so in birds, for example, they, again, using the idea that their hemispheres um, just see one side of the world, they will use their right eye or left hemisphere preferentially to look on the ground for focused attention, whereas they'll use their left eyeball and right hemisphere to look for the environmental and perceived threats. This is across different species. They've actually repeated these studies in different fish studies. And the question is, how does this apply to humans and humans' perception of the world? And the ability to sort of see how humans perceive the world and how the different hemispheres perceive the world really started in the 1960s um, with Michael Gazzaniga using split brain patients. These are patients who, because of intractable epilepsy, have a surgery to actually sever that corpus callosum. The idea being preventing one seizure from one side of the brain, crossing over and causing a seizure on the other side of the brain. And the surgeries work, they did reduce um, seizures. Um, and presented a case where we could actually test the individual role of the two hemispheres by these visual perception tasks that were being done by um, Dr. Gazanica, where he would show an image on a screen for a hundred, hundredth of a millisecond, just long enough to prevent the person from shifting their eyes while they focus straight ahead and ask, what did you see? And when the image was portrayed in the right visual field, which is perceived in our brains and human brains by the left, they were able to name the object, that's in orange. But whenever it was presented to the left visual space, which is perceived by our right hemisphere, um, they could say, they could talk in generic terms about it, like I see something, but I don't know exactly what it is, I can't describe it. And then when shown a list of words, they could instantly point to the orange and knew what, what it was that they were seeing, but couldn't articulate what they were seeing, again, pointing to that lateralization of language. June Wada, while still a resident, um, uh, was uh, discovered the use of sodium um, amabarbital to do what's now called the Wada test, where you can actually anesthetize one, per, uh, one hemisphere for a few minutes at a time um, with uh, an anesthetic and actually test what happens to um, perception of the world and, and the person's in engagement with the world. So this is Dr. Wada, um, videos on YouTube are awesome. You can find this video. Um, he's asking the patient to wiggle their fingers and count to 10. So they're wiggling their fingers, counting one, two, three, and then he injects into the left hemisphere in this case. And what happens is the left hemisphere gets anesthetized. The person stops counting because they can no longer talk and the right arm drops um, only to be relieved a few minutes later as the anesthetic effect uh, wears off. But what they've been able to do is to take that a bit further and use water testing to actually um, figure out, is there a way to um, further quantify the perception of our environment or how we perceive truth and reality or emotional states? Um, so for example, presenting a case of uh, um, a, a sort of postulate, set of postulates like a, um, a monkeys climb trees, a porcupine is a monkey, porcupines climb trees. Well, that's not true. And anyone who has the left hemisphere anesthetized where the right hemisphere is, is still able to see that will say, no, that's not true. Porcupines don't climb trees. But if you anesthetize the right hemisphere where only the left hemisphere is active and you give that same proposition, they'll say, yeah, because that's what it says. Well, you know that porcupines don't climb trees. Well, yeah, but that's what this says. So porcupines climb trees. They have a, a failure to appreciate sort of the wider whole um, outside of what was written down on a piece of paper. So what does all this mean and where am I going with all of this? Um, again, I started this whole thing with, this is a lot of controversial topics. I think that what should be agreed upon is that there is some lateralization of brain activity. There does seem to be this sort of asymmetry in the functioning of the brain that we have to assume has structural and evolutionary benefit. Um, 
And so uh, owner is the one who, Dr. Guntergen is, uh, Guntergen is out of uh, Germany, he's Turkish born neuroscientist who um, is the one who studied pigeons and says, um, and has been one of the world experts in sort of this lateralization, talks about hemispheric asymmetries um, pervade practically all major neural systems of the human brain. There is hardly any perceptual cognitive or motor system that is not affected by left-right differences of at least some of its subcomponents. And this holds true for genetic representation and genes that are expressed preferentially in one hemisphere versus another. It has to do with the amount of neurotransmitter in one hemisphere over another. Dopamine, for example, seems to be more prevalent in the left hemisphere, whereas um, norepinephrine seems to be more prevalent in the right hemisphere, for example. So this lateralization of activity is happening, and we have to imagine that it's going to have, it would seem reasonable, and studies have at least suggested that there is a um, effect on how we perceive the world. And so now at the risk of um, uh, causing a whirlwind of debate, um, I, I am going to put up my own pop culture sort of poster in a way and talk about in generic terms, what does research suggest about lateralization and specialization. And anytime I see a diagram like this, probably like a lot of you, I cringe. And so trying to create some generic or general um, uh, way of looking at this is difficult and is fraught with caveats and a lot of counterexamples that, that can be had. But I think we need to talk about this as, as a neurology community and, and what does this mean for how we engage the world. So the left hemisphere tends to favor certainty. Things are fixed or frozen in time. In fact, people who have lesions of the right hemisphere tend to have palynopsia, where the world seems to be a staccato of effect of cinematic sort of, of, of cuts of film almost. Um, things seem to be frozen, whereas the right hemisphere is more accepting of possibility and novelty. Once things quit being novel, it gives it over in terms of left hemisphere processing and dominance. Things are constantly changing and it's okay with that. The left hemisphere tends to perceive the specific. It likes the explicit. It likes to categorize things and put things in the boxes. It's our way of, of making sense of the world, of being particular about the world, creating a map, for example, which is very useful, but is not a true representation of reality. Even if the map were a life-size map of the world, wouldn't um, get all of the, of the details of, of reality, but yet it serves its purpose. And, and the left hemisphere is very good at that and understanding that. Whereas the right hemisphere tends to perceive the whole. It understands the implicit it. It talks, it thinks about things from a configurational perspective and the human picture that I showed you with the human chopped up into little pieces. It understands perspective a little bit better. The left hemisphere is more general. It tends to be more abstract, flat. It's representing things similar to what the map example I gave you, whereas the right hemisphere is more contextual, looking at depth, appreciation of depth um, in three dimensions. It understands metaphor, jokes, irony, in a way that the left hemisphere seems to have a more difficult time in, in appreciating. The left hemisphere is more focused on tools and the inanimate um, structures that we create. It's why we reach out and grasp things with our right hand. And in fact, some theories are postulating that that's actually why is because the left hemisphere's role is to manipulate the world. And so it reaches out to grasp with the hand that it controls. Whereas the right hemisphere is more interested in the animate, a vivid realism and living things. Um, just as a thought experiment here for some of you if um, off camera, I want you to imagine that you're holding a baby in your hands right now. Um, and for those of you that are on camera, don't do it because you'll, you'll, you'll ruin this, but like, um, so you're holding a baby in your arms, you're supporting the head of the baby in your arms, and you're looking down at the face of that baby. Chances are you're looking to your left. You're looking at a live living thing. And so that's sort of a function of our right hemisphere attending to our left hemispace. Um, there are lots of other examples of this. When we kiss, for example, we tend to turn our head in one direction. When babies are born, they tend to turn their head from one direction. There's lots of other sort of examples of this. Um, the left hemisphere tends to be unreasonably optimistic. Um, the example of the patient I gave who seemed to ignore her deficits and wasn't really concerned about the deficits at all and seemed to be doing fine. There was nothing wrong with her. Um, whereas the right hemisphere takes a more realistic and often somewhat pessimistic view of the world, tends to be the doubter saying, well, what if that's not right? Um, emotional states, it's a very hard thing to talk about lateralization of this, but in general, euphoria, paranoia, and what we talked about with anger being highly lateralized to the left hemisphere. <laughs> Whereas the right hemisphere tends to be more of a depressive sort of state when activated. Um, we see this sometimes in seizure or postictal states where depression seems to manifest as something that tends to be the dominant emotional state that's lateralized on the right. 
In terms of musical or art inclination, um, it's not that the left hemisphere cannot appreciate art or appreciate music, but it tends to be more abstract, tends to be more focused on the rhythm of music, whereas the right hemisphere tends to be more natural realism in artwork and tends to have more of an appreciation for harmony, melody, and rhythm. So those are some gross oversimplifications I know, and I cringe every time somebody just like you probably are off camera, but, um, but I wanted to start to do this because it, it plays into the next step of what I'm gonna do. So here's our, our second poem. The world is too much with us late and soon getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. This is a poem by William Wordsworth. I'll let you read the rest of that in the sake of time. But I wanted to talk about what effect this lateralization might have on culture. And I think it would be naive to assume that if the two hemispheres are perceiving the world in different ways, if we accept that that is a possibility, then at a, at a, at a public level or a population-based level, it must have an impact on, on culture, or at least can have an impact on culture. And what um, Ian McGilchrist, who's, who was originally an English major and, and uh, interested in history, um, uh, it talks about in the book is this idea that there seems to be this balance between the two hemispheres, that in certain situations, one hemisphere, particularly the left hemisphere, tends to predominate in its perception of the world and that that has an impact on culture and, and on art, which we can see manifest in art, we can see manifest in literature, in music. Um, and so the examples are in prehistory, um, uh, looking at prehistoric uh, art, artwork, um, very few of them had any faces. Um, it was mostly body parts and animals, um, tended to be sort of stick figures, very much a left hemisphere sort of appreciation of the world. Whereas when we get into the ancient world, particularly in sixth century BC Greece, you start to see much more of an appreciation for the human form. You get people like Heraclitus talking about flow, never stepping in the same river twice. Um, and you get uh, an appreciation for um, perspective in artwork and depth in artwork in some of the mosaics that were done around this time. It was in the late ancient, ancient period though that we started to get into the dark ages where an, a focus on reason, a focus on getting away with um, this sort of romantic notion of what the emotions had and the emotions ability to control our, our world. In fact, Socrates was famous um, for saying things about how uh, you know, how art would be outlawed in the New Republic and Plato's Republic. And so it was in the Dark Ages that we seem to have this more um, effect of a uh, left brain uh, world, the left brain being more um, dominant in its perspective of the world. And so we would see artwork, for example, that lacked perspective, was more flat. Objects were sized according to their importance in the picture, but didn't have a realism. Images um, of the religious sort had, you know, baby Jesuses that had male adult human heads, for example. Um, so this sort of uh, um, warping of, of reality and perspective. We get into the Renaissance and we start to see the reemergence and this balance again of a perspective of nature and sort of the natural world. And we get sort of metaphor and, and writing starts to be enriched with the works of Shakespeare and Leonardo. Towards the end of the Renaissance period into the Reformation with Martin Luther, though we start to get back to this sort of um, lack of appreciation for um, how uh, the effect of nature and the effect of sort of um, human form can have, it seemed to be unethical actually to portray that. And so you started to see artwork portray things in a very um, lined way. Oh, seeing a mark uh, right on my screen. Um, and so, so they see, tended to have that sort of ability. Yeah. In the Enlightenment uh, with Immanuel Kant, this was the age of reason. So again, reason was put at the pinnacle. And so you started to see the disappearance and artwork of natural light. Light seemed tended to be artificial, this sort of otherworldly sort of view of the world. And then in Romanticism, the Romantic period with William Wordsworth, we started to see more depth and three dimensions uh, emerge again in this balance again between the right and the left. And then I'm gonna group the others just for the sake of time, the industrial revolution, modernism and postmodernism, where again, we started to see this, um, this appreciation more for straight lines and what the left hemisphere might appreciate in terms of a lack of reality um, in its representation of the world. These are gross generalizations I realize, and I don't have enough time to go into every single period across um, history. Um, but I think it's an interesting sort of thought to think about could our perception of the world that is guided by our brain influence culture in such a way? And what effect might that have on our uh, world? So this is the third and last poem, That Shadow My Likeness by Walt Whitman. That shadow my likeness that goes to and fro, seeking a livelihood, chattering, chaffering, how often I find myself standing and looking at it where it flits. 
how often I question and doubt whether that is really me, but in these um, and among my lovers and caroling my songs, oh, I never doubt whether that is really me. And this appreciation, I think, for um, uh, the things that are outside of our day-to-day -day lived reality. So what might this have and why, why did I take an interest in this? For, so the last time I spoke at Grand Rounds, I talked about the history of innovation across time and its effect on healthcare and health IT, in fact. And in the Department of Defense, um, we had an electronic health record at the time that was very much about categorizing, very much what I would say a left hemisphere view of the world where we had to sort of put things into buckets and unfortunately, there were a lot of these sort of buckets that were created for us that made no sense whatsoever. So these are some ex actual examples from the electronic health record of budgets, uh, of buckets and categorization that were created. And unfortunately, it would create a note even if we were trying. So this is a note me trying to document a migraine headache that read more like a ransom note. And what I found is that what these notes lacked was something that music has, timing, tone, and depth. Where does um, timing is which symptom came first? Tone is which one is more important than another? And depth would be the psychiatric sort of depth of a particular interaction. Um, and so it was a result of that that ultimately ended up in an assistant secretary of defense memo where they actually talked about the importance of time, tone, and depth in our interaction and writing of medical records and, and cataloging of medical records. And I worry that, you know, if this is true, that the, if we accept the possibility that the hemispheres and the lateralization of activity can influence culture, and if it's true that the left hemisphere view of the world or perception of the world seems to predominate in an era where we close ourselves off from reality, close ourselves off from the natural world, um, then the world that we're creating right now is created by the left hemisphere. And one of the arguments um, that was put forward in, in the book was this idea that um, we're in a hall of mirrors, that the left hemisphere has become very good. It's a very comfortable environment. Um, for all you know, this entire presentation could be recorded. We're in a virtual world right now. If I hit pause on a video and suddenly switch to another camera that was live, um, it would blow, it, you know, you would have no idea that that was going on. For all you know, this, none of you are here. I don't, I, I see very few of you on video. And so we're surrounding ourselves constantly by a world in which the left hemisphere tends to predominate. And when that happens, the right hemisphere no longer has the ability to look at the gestalt. Um, for, for most of human history, the, right, the view of the right hemisphere was the view of the environment which surrounded all of us. And now we're living in a world of straight lines um, and uh, artificial virtual reality that um, with screens in front of us. I was gonna post a picture on my trip back from the American Academy of Neurology on the plane, looking down the aisle and everybody looking at a monitor in front of them on the plane. Um, and so when that happens, I think that we get the risk, we run the risk of locking ourselves into a left hemisphere perspective of the world that lacks an appreciation for empathy, that lacks an appreciation for the other. Um, and if that's true, then um, we might see other things start to predominate that look like a left hemisphere version of the world. So where does all this go? I don't know. I don't know what this means for the future. I think that it's a compelling argument. Um, I'm not sure I did it justice in an hour um, to talk through every little aspect of, of how the hemispheric dominance might uh, invade and, and impact culture, um, but I'll be happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Dr. Stephenson. That was, that was really cool. I enjoyed that a whole lot. Um, already a couple comments and questions here, I think. Um, Dr. Pokla, uh, early in the talk, said Dr. Elliot Ross at the University of Oklahoma has some great videos about aphasia and aprosodia. Always a hard word for me. Aprosodia. A prosodia. There we go. <laughs> a prosodia. Yeah. So um, thank you. I'm actually super familiar with that because I went to the University of Oklahoma and he taught one of our classes. In fact, I can just see Justin uh, Rousseau rolling over, probably rolling his eyes at me for not mentioning uh, Elliot Ross in the talk. There just wasn't enough time to go down into the prosody discussion. There you are. I knew it. Um, so he taught both of us actually at the University of Oklahoma and, and that was the first time I had learned prosody was in med school. Interestingly, our literary magazine for the medical school, which will be coming out soon, is going to be called prosody for those who are interested. Cool. Um, uh, Dr. Petafar says, wonderful talk, Dr. Stephenson. Is there lateralization in, quote, thinking fast, instinctive, intuitive versus thinking slow, deliberate, or fact-based? Yeah, so this is Seligman and some of his work. I think um, the, it depends on what you're thinking about, I think, and what the perception needs to be. I think that there, there does seem to be, for example, in recognition of facial emotions and expressivity of emotional response tends to be more lateralized one way or the other. 
Um, so yeah, I would I I don't know all of the literature on that, but um, but I do think that it would tend to be more lateralized um, in in terms of whatever um, uh, hemisphere was most ad adept at, at evaluating that, whether it be tone in a um, particular musical piece and or um, or, or you know the recognition of uh, you know, a particular word, for example, where we can't inhibit reading of a word, for example. Dr. Pokola said Elliot Ross's lectures got me interested in neurology. Yeah, he's really amazing. I actually, um, there's a whole talk that we given on just the emotional valence of language. Um, I actually want to do a talk separately on, on music and the effect on the brain as well. It's actually what started the whole conversation with my piano teacher um, was uh, he and I doing maybe a joint grand rounds, uh, actually playing piano together. So maybe we'll share that in the emotional expressivity of, of language and the origins of language being probably rooted in music, actually, music and dance. There's a lot of theories about where did language come from. Um, there's some suggestion that actually it was more gestural based and more movement based. Hmm. Dr. Hilsebeck got to learn from Dr. Ross as well on an internship. Wow, we all got to, to meet Dr. Ross. Yeah, he's, he's great. Network. I had a, a quick question. Oh, well, here's one. Okay, sorry. Uh, Dr. Roach says, how do the lateralization phenomena manifest in dementia? Yeah, so in dementia, in Alzheimer's in particular, um, we seem to have an effect on the left hemisphere first and then um, slowly emerging over into the right hemisphere. There, there is lateralization in disease. Um, that has important implications for us in terms of, and, and part of that's driven, we think, by um, the preferential sort of expression of both genes and neurotransmitter function in between the two hemispheres. And Kushbu Verma says, we have to be careful with the evidence for the hemispheric differences are still debatable. The confound with the pigeon study is that rather than looking for the complete faces or bodies, pigeons may be looking for the individual body parts, and that could explain their results rather than, than the hemispheric differences. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's still, it's not that one hemisphere is seeing the human and the other is not. Both are seeing the human, but the way in which they're perceiving the human is, is different. And I think that the evidence is pretty compelling in that example. I don't do it justice maybe, and there's been subsequent follow-up studies looking at this, but actually it's, it's looking at the entire, is it an entire human or not? Or is it a bit of a human? And so whether it's an arm, a leg, a face, I used a face as an example, but, um, but the left hemisphere tends to be very adept at looking at very specific discrete elements um, that it can categorize and put into a box and say, that is a face, that must be a human. Whereas the right hemisphere tends to say, well, it's a face, but it's not part of, a, of an overall human. So it's not a human. All right, and last one, Dr. Malabit said, thank you for an amazing talk, Dr. Stevenson. Do you know if ECT had been tried on right versus left hemisphere and if there are different effects? I do know about transcranial Doppler and, and I'm, I'm sorry, not uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation um, being used to actually show hemispheric difference and, and stimulate and activate one hemisphere over another. I am not familiar with ECT as much. I know that um, there's probably others on the, on the, talk, on the call who, who may have an answer to that, but I'm not as familiar with that. Yeah, it would be interesting to think about what effects it ha what effects laterality has on mental health as well. Um, Alyssa Aguirre says, thank you, Dr. Stephenson. This makes me curious about how our brains and bodies store traumatic memories and how that correlates with treatments for PTSD, such as EMDR. Yeah. yeah um, memories are pretty well represented across both hemispheres. Different components of memories, you know, may be more preferentially um, acted upon in one hemisphere or another. In fact, when we reenact memories, we tend to have a hemispheric dominance on, on the right side that reenacts some of those memories. But, um, but yeah, I'm not sure exactly on how, uh, how the treatment of PTSD has been guided by that. I know that there has been a lot of renewed interest in how this lateralization may impact um, human neurologic disease and what we can learn about human neurologic disease from the lateralization evidence that's come out. And to finish, Dr. Keats, a neurologist and pianist grand rounds would be amazing. I really hope to do that at some point. Thank you guys. Um, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll <laughs> okay, get a chance can, to do you that. You can choose to answer Devin Leslie's question. <laughs> Which would you pick if you had a, only one? Both. Number? You need both. You need both. Both are important for survival. It's, it's not what they do, it's how they do it. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Dr. Stephenson. Yep. Thank you.